And so the first thing I want to do is to talk about perimeter. There's uh, area and perimeter. And so you'll have some geometric shapes. And there's not really, uh, there are some formulas for perimeter in some cases. But uh, generally, if you want the perimeter, you just want to figure out what the distance is around the shape. That's all it is, the distance around the shape. That's perimeter. And so if you have a, a rectangle like this and they have two of the sides labeled, then there is a formula that says that the perimeter is two lengths plus two widths. But you really don't need to use that formula because all you have to do is add up the four sides and count the distance around. So this is six and this is three and this side is opposite this one. So this one is also six meters. And this one is also three meters because it's opposite the other one. So the perimeter would be three plus six plus three plus six. And when you add all those together, you get 18. Now I'm going to require the unit. In this case, it's just a length. It's a distance around. So imagine that you're walking six meters and then three meters and then six meters and then three meters. How many total distance? Well, it's 18 meters. Now the area is different because for this one, the area is length times width in a rectangle. And so you would be multiplying six meters times three meters. You multiply the numbers to get 18, but then the unit is meters times meters. So meters squared or square meters. And so you'll notice that for the perimeter and the area, in this case, they turn out to be the same number, but the unit is different. Area will always have a square unit. Perimeter will always have a just a regular unit. OK, um, what's the uh, perimeter? We've done enough with area already, so let's just focus on perimeter. Uh, go ahead and calculate the perimeter in each case. All right, we'll start with number nine. Um, go ahead and put your answer in the chat. Remember, it's the distance around the shape. So even though you've got these kind of extraneous numbers kind of hanging around here, like dot, 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 it's not really. The shape is the, the triangle. So if you're going to figure out the perimeter of the triangle, you just start in one corner and just start adding the distances as you go around. And there's three sides you need to add together. So go ahead in the chat and write down the perimeter of number nine. Uh, be sure to include the units. You may want to have your calculator handy because some of these numbers are messy and uh, it's much easier and much more accurate to use your calculator than some paper and pencil uh, algorithm. Question mark if you don't know. Okay, uh, good. It looks like uh, 26.7 yards uh, is the answer. So you're going to add the 12.3 and the 4.6 and the 9.8. All right, let's take a look at a quadrilateral. Uh, how about number six? This is called a parallelogram. The opposite sides are equal. What is the perimeter? OK, so again, I wanted to do this one just because that 43, it turns out to be the, the height of the, of the uh, parallelogram. You would definitely use that number if you wanted to find the area. But if you want to find the perimeter, you just add those two numbers, 92, and those two numbers, um, 116. 92 plus 116 is, really, and that unit is feet. OK, so this one would not be square feet because it's not a unit of area. So it's just regular feet. So what do you call a, a quadrilateral four-sided shape that has all equal sides? Turns out that squared is not the right answer um, because we can have a, a shape. Just imagine taking a square and taking the opposite corners and just stretching them. So you're stretching the angles, but you're not breaking up the quadrilateral. So you could have this thing that looks like this, where all these sides are the same. Used to be a square, but we took these two sides and we pulled them apart. It stayed together, the whole shape, and all four sides are the same. Uh, a, uh, this is called a rhombus, a rhombus. A square is a special kind of a, ro a rhombus. A square is a rhombus that has four equal angles. So four sides equal, you have a square, but a square has an added condition that all four angles are the same. A rhombus is, is something like this. If you have 
um, opposite sides equal, then you're looking at a parallelogram. These sides are equal and these sides are equal. This is two sets of opposite equal sides, parallelogram. A special kind of a parallelogram is a rectangle. A rectangle like a square has the added condition that it has right angles. But two sets of opposite equal sides. So four equal sides, two sets of opposite equal sides. What if we have two sets of adjacent equal sides? These are all quadrilaterals. They all have four sides. But a lot of times we classify them based on the number of equal sides that they have. They can have four equal sides. They can have two sets of opposite equal sides. Or they can have adjacent. So let's say these are the same. And then these are the same. That's a quadrilateral. Now these two sides that are next to one another or adjacent, they're equal. And these two adjacent sides are equal. Two sets of adjacent equal side. What's the geometric name for this guy? It's a kite. It is indeed a kite. So that little toy that we play with is named from a geometric shape. But there's only one of those. Now, another one has to do with, you know, the number of, you know, if we wanted to classify it in terms of uh, something else, we could classify it in terms of um, our sides parallel. So if you have opposite sides parallel, then you have a parallelogram. If you have just one set of opposite sides parallel, like this one, okay, or this one, if these two sides are parallel, these two sides are parallel, but the other sides are not parallel, then we have a trapezoid. There's no requirement on the measures of the sides for a trapezoid. It's just the one set of opposite sides are parallel. So both of these are trapezoids. This one is a trapezoid. Okay, um, one thing I haven't talked about are circles. And so um, let's take a look at uh, the formulas for a circle. And then we'll do some more problems on irregular shapes. And we'll start off with a, a can of tennis balls. Here it is. The distance around, all right, so it's like this. This is called a cylinder. And a lot of times it, it has um, three balls in it stacked on top of one another. Are right, you familiar with the tennis can? All right, if we just look at this top circle, the distance around, that's called the circumference. And um, in this cylinder, this distance that goes from the top of the cylinder to the bottom of the cylinder is known as the height. So here's the problem. What, imagine that you have that can of tennis balls in front of you. What is longer? What is a, what is a longer distance? The distance around the top of the circle, the top of the can, that distance, or is the height? Circumference is, I'll just call it C for circumference. Which is larger, H or C? Go ahead and answer. If you don't know, it's multiple choice. Put a question mark. What is longer, the distance around a can? All right, just imagine you have this can in front of you, right? You know what the size of a tennis ball looks like. Hmm, everybody's saying C. Is that based on a calculation of some sort? All right, uh, maybe you've seen this before, but uh, it is indeed the circumference is longer. And the reason for that is that the circumference is two pi r. And the height, let's do the height. All right, so from here to here, this is a diameter of a ball. And there's three balls and um, they each have the same size and so the height is equal to three diameters. If you just take one diameter plus another diameter, whatever that diameter is, you just take three of them and that gives you the height of the, of the can. Now the circumference is two pi r, but in a circle, the radius is exactly one half the size of the diameter. So two radiuses equals one diameter. Since 2r is equal to a diameter, we could say that the circumference also is pi times d. So if we write the length of the circum circumference, pi times d, and then the height of the three balls is 3 times d, we can see that the circumference is larger 
because the value of three of pi is just a little bit more than three. It's 3.14. So 3.14d is a little bit larger than 3d. So the circumference is bigger than the... All right, so this little problem is, you can see the circumference there as well, is uh, illustrates this idea of the, the distance around. So the circumference is the perimeter, but it's uh, the perimeter of a curved shape. So it's the distance around. So it's still a distance. And the area is pi r squared, pi times the radius squared. OK, so here are a couple of problems. Um, they want you to find the circumference and the area. Keep in mind that the circumference is a length. So our answer is going to be in terms of meters, whereas area is in terms of square units. So the area is going to be in terms of square meters. All right, so the circumference is 2 pi r. I write it this way because the radius is given to us to be 9 meters. So generally, we just attach, attach the unit at the end. So this is 2 pi times 9, or 18 pi. Now, depending upon, and that's meters, uh, depending upon how uh, you know Newton Alto wants the answer, sometimes they'll say round to certain decimal places. This would be the exact value. If you want the decimal approximation, just remember pi is close to 3, so 3 times 18. On your calculator, pi is right there above the caret symbol, so above the division sign, it's right there, pi. If you type in pi, it'll give you pi to nine decimal places. And if you do 18 pi, it's going to multiply 18 by that 3.14 and give you the decimal version. All right, so we'll round this out to three decimal places, and we'll say that this is approximately equal to 56.549 meters. So exact answer, decimal approximation. Both are correct. And uh, for the next, uh, for this one here too, we have uh, the area is equal to pi r squared. Again, this is the best formula to use because we know the radius. So pi 9 squared is 81, and meters times meters is square meters. So we can write that as 81 pi square meters, or give the decimal approximation from the calculator, 254.469. OK, uh, why don't you try number 24? Uh, what you'll notice about number 24, and um, you know, let's let's do the area and the perimeter. All right, and if there's a curved shape, we might have to call it the circumference. But find the distance around perimeter, and then also find the area. So perimeter equals how many inches, and the area equal equals how many square inches. A feeling. Okay, I'm looking at the chat now. Yeah, when questions like this are posed, you kind of go for the non-intuitive answer. You go ahead and put your answers in the chat. It's always nice when your daughter comes up and hands you a note. Brownies are for Oliver's parents, don't touch. Thank you. Okay, so um, you know, it looks like some information is missing. Now, what you can do is you notice that this is a right triangle. So you can find this side right here uh, I'll just call it D, because it also happens to be the diameter of that half circle. Now, your steps would be find the value of D by using the Pythagorean theorem, because you're missing one side and you know the other two sides of a triangle. So do, you know, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, and then you'll find D. Well, D is the, not only um, is D the diameter of this half circle here, uh, but, and we'll assume that this is a half circle. It's also one of the lengths of the sides that you need in order to calculate the area of the triangle. So find D, then find the area of the triangle, then find both the circumference and the area of the half circle, and that'll put you on the way to, to answering this. So why don't you do D first in inches? So in the chat, tell me what D is. 
Then once you get D, then tell me what the perimeter or the area is in any order. Perimeter and then the area. Okay, so this, I pulled this out of this uh, picture here. And so by the Pythagorean theorem, D squared plus nine squared equals 15 squared. And we just kind of work it down from there. So D equals 12. We know that D has to be less than 15 uh, because 15 is the hypotenuse and the hypotenuse of a triangle is always the largest side. So D is equal to 12. So if the diameter is 12, that means if you need it, the radius is half that. So if you had the whole circle, then the area would be pi r squared. And we know the ra radius is six, so that's 36 pi. And because I'm gonna be adding this with some other numbers, I'm gonna convert it to a decimal, 36 pi. And I'll always round to three decimal places. All right, that's not what we have here, however. We have half a circle. And by symmetry, then the half circle is half the area. Divide, so take the area, divide by two. So take the 113.097 and divide by two. So the area of the half circle would be 56.54, and I'll call it nine. The circumference of the circle is pi d, which is pi times 12, 12 pi as a decimal number, 37.699. That would be the circumference of the whole circle. So for a half circle, you have half the circumference. Okay, so that's all the kind of uh, the calculations you have to do. And, and so now you have to maybe calculate the area of a couple more shapes or maybe that triangle. And we know that this, we just calculated this to be 18.850. And again, that's in inches. And then we have the 15, and then we have the nine. So if we're gonna walk around the perimeter, the outside, we're just gonna add those three measures. All right, so this would be 18.850 plus 15 plus nine. And that is, I think you all have that answer in the chat. So perimeter, 42.85, good. It's like many of you had it. All right, good. And then we know that the area is gonna be our 56 number. From over here, we calculated the area of, of half the circle to be 56.549. And then we need to add that. So that's this area. And then we need to add that to the area of the triangle. And the area of the triangle is one half times the base times the height, which is the 12 that we calculated earlier. Okay, so 56.549 plus 0.5 times 9 times 12, 110.549. And I see that answer as well. All right, so this is a multi-step problem, right? And it was even trickier because you really needed to find the height of that, of that triangle. And the only way to find it is to use something that it didn't suggest in the problem that you needed to do. That is, use the Pythagorean theorem to find that vertical side first. Can you think in indeterminate co um, coefficients? If I told you that this side was A and this side was B, could you calculate the area in the perimeter? You know, probably not the perimeter. Maybe the area. No, oh, I think you could do it. So this one, they label the side A and this side B, and, and they also tell you that this is an isosceles triangle. Want to try it? What's the area? What's the perimeter? Find the area in the perimeter. Okay, it's uh, 333. Let's, let's meet back at uh, 345. I'll, I'll do this problem while you're out. So we'll come back at 345. Yeah, so uh, uh, this one, since they, they didn't give you uh, the measures of the angles, the best you can use is the formulas. And they said that this was an isosceles triangle so that two of these, these two non-hypotenuse sides must, must be the same. So this one was B and so therefore this one is B. So anyways, if we worked this one out and we wanted to know what the perimeter and area would be, turns out that the best we could do would be these formulas here. All right, so there's some other application problems uh, here as well, like um, so this one here. 
Uh, which one of the following is a better buy? Uh, a large pizza, one large pizza with a 16 inch diameter. Usually when they uh, when you order a 16 inch pizza, the measurement of the 16 is the diameter. Or two small pizzas that are 12 inch pizza, 12 inch inch pieces, pizzas. Right? So you can get this pizza, or you can get pizza pizza. This one here. Now this one costs 12 dollars. Oops, read that wrong. These are 10 inch pizzas. All right, so they're both the same. Uh, which one would you buy? 16 or two tens? Both cost 12 bucks. Two 10 inch pieces. If I said there was no correct answer, which one would you select? 16 or 10? 16 or two ten? All right, so it looks like you're going with the two. Maybe you like variety and choose two different pizzas. Well, I mean, this is a, a problem appropriate for uh, area in perimeter calculations. And so what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the area and the perimeter because if you like the, if you don't like the crust and you like what's in the mid middle, then you're probably more interested in getting the larger area. However, if you like crust, then maybe you're interested in the largest perimeter when you add those two together. So it really depends on what your interest is. So let's go ahead and calculate the area. Um, this is a diameter, 16, so the radius is 8 inches. And we need the radius because our formula is pi r squared. It's the circumference that is either 2 pi r or pi d. All right, so for this one here, we have uh, pi times 8 squared, and that's 64 pi. So that's the area there. We can convert it if you like, 201. So it's about 201 square inches. So you can think about that as about a square inch is a byte. And so it would be about 201 bytes to eat the whole pizza. Over here, um, again, the area is pi r squared, but the radius over here is five inches. And so if you were to calculate the area over here, the areas of both of these would be the same. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll calculate the area of one and then just double it. So the area here is pi r squared and squaring a five gives you 25 and 25 times pi is, I'll call it 78.5. And again, this is square inches. But this one over here is also 78.5. So if you put them together, you get 157 square inches. So if you're interested in the stuff in the middle, not the crust, and you're just interested in the number of bytes and you're treating all the bytes the same, then the better buy is this one here because you have 201 bytes or 201 square inches, whereas over here it's only 150. This might seem unintuitive, but you can't just add 10 and 10 and get 20 and assume that it's going to be larger. All right, the circumference calculation, uh, this is pi d, which is 16 pi. The diameter is 16, so we'll use the diameter to be 16. And then 16 pi is 50.3, and this would be inches. So just imagine going around and you're at 50, 50 inches around that big pizza. Whereas over here, and we'll calculate the circumference of one of these circles and then double it to get the crust for two of them. So the diameter in this one is 10. So we have 10 pi, which is 31.4. And if you double 31, you get 62. So the total circumference with these two pizzas, if you would like the, um, if you like the crust, then you're going to get 62.8 inches of crust as opposed to 50.3. So if you're a fan of crust, maybe you'll go with these two. If you're a fan of what's inside the pizza, maybe this one's the best one. But probably the answer to this question is based on area. So since they both cost the same amount, these two pizzas cost 12 bucks and this pizza costs 12 bucks. I don't know of pizzas these days that cost 12 bucks, but this is probably the best because you get about 50 
you know, just lay about 40, 44 bites more with this pizza than this one. 44 square inches more with the big pizza as opposed to the two smaller ones. Now, if they gave us these two prices and they said that, you know, one was $13 and the other one was $12, then we would have to break it down a little further and maybe try to calculate the cost per bite. All right, there's several applications that um, you'll be asked to do. Here's another one. You've got a kite. Um, what's the perimeter in the area of a kite? Uh, and this might be a representation of a, a track at a high school. You, know, you go here, there's a football field in the middle, and then you got these rounded circles, and then how far around the track is it? Uh, here's another application uh, where you want to find the area of the shaded region. So if you take the area of the big circle, and subtract the area of the small circle, you get the area of the donut or, or washer, which is the shaded region. So you'd have pi, <clears throat> okay, for the big, the big circle, the radius is four. And then the area of the small circle is pi r squared where r is two. All right, so there's just a, a variety of, of applications that involve area that you may have seen at some point. All right, I want to leave the area and perimeter and go up to a new dimension, three dimensions. These two sections are from uh, 1581 and 1582. And uh, what we're after here is volume. And remember that volume is like length times width times height and in a, in a box like this. And so if you, if each of them there are in inches, measured in inches, you're going to be multiplying three inches times four inches times seven inches or something like that. Inches times inches times inches is cubic inches. So make sure that you indicate your unit with cubic inches or cubic units. So lengths are just regular inches, area, square inches, and volume, cubic inches, inches to the, key of the, to the third power. And so uh, in this section, they start off by giving you a bunch of formulas and you'll wanna have this formula handy. You've got the volume of a rectangular solid, a box, and you multiply the length times the width times the height to get the volume. If all three of the sides are the same, you have a cube. And so, but you still multiply length times width times height. But since all the lengths are the same, we just write that S to the third power the length of the side cubed. Uh, all of these are volumes, so we're all gonna have, all gonna have cubic measures. Uh, if you have a pyramid, now a pyramid has a, a base, a bottom part, and then it has, a, uh, imagine a single point sitting above the base that's laying on the ground. To be a pyramid, you have to connect this top point, as a point at the top, to all of the vertices of the base. Many times the base is gonna be a, uh, a four-sided shape, a quadrilateral, so you'll have four different sides coming down. Sometimes the base is a, is a triangle, and then you're just going to have three different lines coming down. This one looks like uh, it has four. So down to this side, down to this side, you can't quite see it, but down to the back side there, and then down to this side. And that's a pyramid, and it turns out that uh, the the volume of a pyramid is one third the volume of a box that has the same dimensions. All right, now the B equals the area of the base. So if the base is a square, you know, with side length, um, I'll just call it X. So if this is X by X, then the area of the base is a square. And the area of that square is X times X or X squared. So if that were the case, then the volume would be one third times x squared times h. And if the base is a rectangle, length times width, then the volume of the pyramid would be one third length times width times height. And this is where I said that the volume of a pyramid is equal to one third times the volume of a box, box up here. Interesting. One third. Who would have thought? Uh, a right circular cylinder, uh, right, so that you have a right angle. 
down here and up here. So the, the cylinder comes right straight up as opposed to being something like this. So it's not tilted in any way. Straight vertical up and down like a can, right? And if you notice, the pi r squared piece of the volume is the area of the base. So we could say just base times height here, and that would be correct. But the base in this case is a circle where the radius is r. So the area of the base is equal to pi r squared. And so you take pi r squared, that circle, and then multiply it by the height, and you've got the volume of the cylinder. There's a relationship, just like there's a relationship between a perimeter of, or the a pyramid, uh, the, vo the volume of a pyramid and the volume of a box, that same relationship holds if you're looking at the volume of a, um, of a cylinder compared to the volume of a cone. So the volume of the cylinder is pi r squared h. And notice this one here also has pi r squared h, but it's a one third of that. So the volume of that cone is exactly one third of the volume of that cylinder. So if you flip this cone upside down and filled it up with water up to the top and then dumped it into here, it would take three of these cones to fill up this cylinder that have the same dimension. All right, and then uh, finally, we've got the volume of a, of a sphere. And a sphere is, um, you know, it's volume, so we want cubic units. So whatever the, the radius unit is, if it's in inches, we're going to take it to the third power, inches times inches times inches. And then this pi always comes uh, in the formula as well. Four thirds pi r cubed. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the formulas. We do have uh, areas as well, whereas uh, the volumes would be, you know, how much would it take to fill the cylinder or the cone or the sphere? How much unit is contained inside? The surface area is a question where it's on the surface, but it's on the outside surface. And the question that we would ask here is, you know, how much paint would it take to paint the entire outside of this box or this box or this cylinder? This is a cube. So we don't give the surface area for all of the shapes, but we do give the surface area for a couple of them because we can deduce them pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, if you think about a cube, it has one, two, three, four, top, bottom, five, six, six different sides that all have dimension s times s. So you have six s times s's or six s squared. And that's what it would take to paint the outside of the box. When the dimensions of the rectangular solid are different, like a box where you have the width and the length and the height and they're all different, what you have is in a box, you have opposite sides have the same area. So you're going to have two of this, the opposite sides of the same area. And then you're going to take these two sides. They're going to have the same area. And then the top and the bottom are going to have the same area. But there's two of each. So this top rectangle and the bottom rectangle are both length times width because they are rectangles. There are two of them, so two times length times width. And that would give the area of the top box, or the top rectangle, and the bottom rectangle. Then if you look at these sides, the back side here, and then the front side here, the dimensions here are W. And then this dimension here is the same as this here, H. So this rectangle here is H times W, H times W. But there's one here. And there's one back here. So there are two of them. And then finally, if you look at this one here, this face here, it's a rectangle. Its height is h, its length is l. But there's another rectangle on the back side that we would have to paint that has the same dimension. So there are two of them. So that's where you get this surface area formula. So they're doing both area and volume in this section, but the area is surface area as opposed to taking the area of a two-dimensional shape. OK, uh, this one we can deduce as well. If you wanted to paint this can, you'd have to paint the top, and you'd have to paint the bottom. And the top and the bottom have the same area. They're both circles. So the top and bottom would be pi r squared, because the radius is r. If you add them together, you have 2. 
pi r squared. Now the next one's a little tricky. So imagine that you have this can and you have this label that goes around the outside of it and you cut it. You cut the label and then you roll it out. So this cut is like right here and the height everywhere around is the same. So this would be the circumference of the circle all the way around and then this would be the height. So if you cut the can and rolled it out, you'd have a rectangle. But the area of the rectangle is length times width. Well, we already have the length or the width, which are, however you want to define that. And when you roll this out and flatten it, this is the circumference. And the circumference of a circle with radius r is 2 pi r. So the area here is length times width, 2 pi r h. So what we do then is we put these two together and we say, if you want to paint the top and the bottom, cover up that area, it's two pi r squared. And then if you want to paint the outside where the label is, that area is two pi r squared. So you would add these two together to get the surface area of a cylinder. All right, I, I wanted to maybe explain where these came, but you know, just know that if you're looking for the surface area, we do have formulas for those that we can use down here. All right, so the first grouping here, uh, this one involves volume. Notice, find the volume. All right, so let's start off with number 10. Number 10, what is the volume? So to answer this question, you look at the, the volume. If you like, you can compare it to this formula. Write down the formula for the volume of a cylinder, pi r squared h, and the height of the cylinder, they give you to be 8, and the radius of the cylinder, you'll get the radius on the top, and the radius on the bottom is 6. So, yep, just go ahead and put the, uh, the radius in there, which is 6 pi r squared. So we're going to square the radius, and all of these are multiplied together, times the height, and the height is 8. So 36 square centimeters times eight centimeters. At some point, you're gonna to wanna to get the calculator out. Square centimeters and then other centimeters is cubic centimeters. So you were correct in the unit there. And then to get the decimal approximation, we're just gonna multiply these three numbers. And I got the same answer you did. Okay, so all of these, let's do a, um, uh, all of these are based on formulas. And once you write down the formula for these here, you can, you, you can come up with the answer pretty quickly. All right, so that's volume. The next one is surface area, this one here. So you have the two different boxes here. Uh, this box is a uh, you know, rectangular solid, but the dimensions are all different. This one is the cube where all the dimensions are the same. So in this one, they want you to calculate the surface area. So give me the surface area. Again, you can put your answer in the chat to this one right here. Now, I think it's, it's best conceptually if you just know how to do it without a formula. But if you do want a formula, this is the one. Surface area for a rectangular solid where all the dimensions are different. So I'll write that down here. Um, two times length times width plus two times length times height plus two times width times height. You just kind of pair them in all the three different ways. Uh, I'm gonna call this one the length and this one the width. It doesn't really matter what you call them, but as long as they're <laughs> used the different dimension for the different variables. But So for this one, um, two times six times, that's six meters times four meters. 24, 48 square meters plus two times the length, six meters times the height, three meters. And that's equal to meters times meters, square meters. 18 times two, 36. And then finally, two times the width, four times the height, three, and two times four times three is 24, 
and again, square meters. So all of the units of square meters, this is a unit of area, I and mean, we measure area in square units. So uh, add those three numbers together, and that's how many square meters you need. It looks like 108. All right, so these are, some of these problems are just one step problem. You locate the correct formula, you locate the dimensions that you need to input into the formula, and then you just get your calculator out and, and punch it through. There's no pi in this one because it's not involving any curved surfaces. All right, the more interesting problems, of course, are the applications. So let's go there next. All right, so just like those uh, problems that involve um, multiple shapes kind of connected together and you were asked to find the, the two-dimensional area of those shapes, now we have volumes that are made up of a couple of different shapes. So this one here is um, a silo where it's got this long cylinder underneath and then it's got like a semicircle on top. So let's assume that this is a semicircle on the top and the bottom part is a cylinder. And uh, you might see these at, on farms. Some of you might come from, we have a lot of farmers around this area. Some of you might come from a farm family. And um, in the fall, they cut down corn and add various things to the corn to create this thing called silage. And they put it in these big, tall, um, silos. And that's what feeds their animals, their, their cattle or whatever animals they have during the, during the winter months when there's no food for them to eat outside. Saves a lot of money. It helps farmers who do both agricultural and, and uh, farming with uh, or raising uh, cattle as well. So there's usually steps that go all the way up to the top. And so they have this escalator that fills it, goes up, and it fills it, drops it in here, and slowly fills it all the way up. And there's this little outside area here with steps. And when they want to distribute the, the silage, uh, they've got these little doors. And every time they use more silage, they take out another door. And then they jump into the silage and they throw it outside one of these windows and it comes down here. With somebody with a wheelbarrow that takes it away and feeds the cows. So a question would be, you know, how much silage can we put in there? If we knew how much, you know, silage that the, the cattle would eat, we'd know what we'd have to plan to feed them for the summer. So our question is, what is the volume if we filled this thing completely up, including this upper part, which never gets filled, by the way, and they have a little trap door on the top to, to let in some air. All right, so use two formulas for the volume to find the volume of each figure. Express each answers in terms of pi and then round to the nearest whole number. All right, so we're gonna get the exact value first and it's gonna involve something pi. And then we're gonna punch it all into the calculator and get the decimal approximation. All units are in terms of feet. So these are very big, big silos. All right, so we need the volume of a cylinder, which is pi r squared h, and then we need the volume of the semicircle. Well, it's not really a semicircle, is it? It's a semisphere. It's half of a sphere. Um, hemisphere. Hemisphere. Well, we have a formula for the cylinder. It's pi r squared h, and for the sphere, it's four-thirds pi r cubed. So for a hemisphere, uh, half of a sphere, it would be exactly half of this area. So four will cancel with the two, leaving a two. So if you want the hemisphere, then the volume would be two thirds pi r cubed. Exactly half of the volume of a sphere. All right, so this is two thirds pi r cubed. Now it turns out that um, the radius of the, of the cylinder is the same thing as the radius of the hemisphere. They're both the same. And they give you the diameter of that circle on the bottom. So the radius is exactly half of that. So the R that we're gonna use in each of these two formulas is 10. And the only place that we use the 50 will be in the calculation of the cylinder. So then the strategy here would be to calculate the volume of the cylinder and add that to the volume of the hemisphere. 
it's not a very good picture of a hemisphere, but and so the volume of the, the cylinder is pi r squared h. And then the volume of the hemisphere is two thirds pi r cubed. All right. So we put together shapes of different kinds, and uh, you know we come up with this other way of of representing it. It's just two different volumes that we're adding together to make the volume of the big shape. All right. So let's just plug in the numbers that we know. We know the radius is ten feet, and the height is fifty feet. So wherever in these, uh, this formula where you see an R, you're going to replace it with 10 feet. Don't forget to square it, times H. H is 50 feet. And then we continue, 2 thirds times pi, pi uh, our radius again, which is 10 feet. And, but this time we're going to cube it. Well, they want the first answer in terms of pi, and they want the second answer just the decimal approximation. So let's work this out. We have pi. If we square 10 feet, well, we got to square the 10. So that's 100. And then we have to square the feet, square feet. And then you got to multiply by the 50 feet. Plus 2 thirds times pi. And well, now we're going to take the 10 feet and we're going to raise it to the third power. So that's 10 feet times 10 feet times 10 feet. 10 times 10 times 10, that's 1,000. And then feet times feet times feet, cubic feet. All right, so just a matter of how many uh, simplifications you want to do here. Um, notice that you're going to have square feet times feet, so cubic feet in the first measure, and then you're going to have cubic feet in the second measure. So when you add them together, you're going to have a certain number of cubic feet. 100 times 50 is 5,000. And then you have the pi. And then down here, you have 2,000 over 3 pi, 2 thirds times 1,000, and then the pi. All right, so this is what the answer would be in terms of pi. And then if you want a decimal approximation to find out how big that really is in real number terms, get this and plug it into your calculator. Okay, so um, close to 18,000 square feet, uh, cubic feet. 18,000 cubic feet. Uh, this, this shape here is similar, but on top you have the hemisphere, half of a sphere, and this one on the bottom you have a cone. So cone volume fo formula is what you're going to need here. This one, a cone on the top and a cylinder. Okay, now to consider the magnitude of the uh, Great Pyramid inside Cairo, Egypt, we now know, we know what these silos look like. We can see them from the road. They contain 17,802 cubic feet. How does that compare to the Great Pyramid in Egypt? So here's a problem that gives us the dimensions of the Great Pyramid outside Cairo, Egypt. It has a square base measuring 756 feet on each side. So that's what the base looks like. So imagine what, what that is, first of all. Um, if you divide it by three, you're going to get 252 yards. So it's equivalent to two football fields, bigger than two football fields wide. That's what the base is. So if you walked around it, it would be a long walk. All right. Now to draw the pyramid, we're just going to identify some point up here. And we're going to connect this point to each one of these vertices to form, it's, it's hard to, to see a three-dimensional shape, but this is what it would look like. We connect to all four sides, or four uh, vertices down here, and you've got the pyramid. Now you can't see it, but if you drew a line from the center of that base, center of that square, up to the top, this right here would be the height of the pyramid. And they tell it, they tell us that the height of that pyramid is 480 feet. All right, so the first question is, what is the volume? So let's calculate the volume and then let's compare it to, you know, the volume of a silo up here. All right, here's our pyramid. And what they tell us to do is take one third times the area of the base, that's B, times the height. So 
it's going to be similar to this picture here where the base is a square. And in order to find the area of the base, we have to multiply x times x. So if we have a square base, then this would be the volume. So all of these problems will originate with the formula. So we have the volume equals one third area of the base times the height. So B equals area of the base. And the area of the base, it's a square. So we take 756 and multiply by 756. So 756 squared, huge number. And it's feet times feet, so that will be square feet. That's just the area of the bottom part, 571,536 square feet. All right, so the volume is one third times the area of the base, one third area of the base, and then times the height. All right, so this is square feet, and then we have times 480 feet. All right, so notice there are no pies in this. These are all kind of right vertical, not curved pieces to make up this pyramid. So we just multiply these three numbers together. And then that would be cubic feet. 91 million cubic feet is the, the Great Pyramid. So just imagine what it would look like if you saw it up close. It would just be this huge structure. And you wonder how many years it took to, to carry those big old limestone blocks from wherever they dug them up to the desert to build this Great Pyramid. But just to give you a sense of the magnitude of this, this is cubic feet and the silo up here is cubic feet. So if you divide the, the volume of the Great Pyramid by the volume of the silo, you'll see that the Great Pyramid is over 5,000 times the volume of one of those sil silos. So just imagine those silos, 5,136 of them standing side by side. And that would be the volume of that, that pyramid. Let's see, the stones to build the Great Pyramid were limestone blocks with an average volume of 1.5 cubic yards. 1.5 cubic yards. Imagine that, how they got those limestone yards, you know, one and a half yards by one and a half yards by one and a half yards. Those are huge blocks that they hauled from somewhere to the desert to build this. All right, 1.5 cubic yards. How many of those blocks would be needed? Oh, I remember we did unit analysis not too long ago. Yeah, I think they probably, um, I think they probably used some kind of pulleys and wheels and something to get them over there. I don't know that they actually know how they got those blocks over there. All right. Now, because this unit is 1.5 cubic yards, we would first have to convert our cubic feet into cubic yards, but we know how to do that. We've done it many times. All right, so this is feet, feet, and feet, and we want to cancel them out and leave yards, yards, yards. So there are three feet in one yard, but we have to multiply by that fraction three times so that we can cancel out all three feet units. So feet, feet, feet go away and we're left with cubic yards. Now if you'll notice that's three times three times three, we would have to divide this number by 27 to get cubic yards. Okay, here it is. And we want to divide that by 27. Three, three, eight, six, eight, eight, zero. Oh. So 91 million cubic feet, 3 million cubic yards. Okay, now, since each block <clears throat> has a size of 1.5 cubic yards, how many blocks would we need? Well, this is how many total cubic feet, cubic yards we have. We're gonna divide it by 1.5 to find out how many blocks we would need to build. All right, so it's just gonna be a division so if we take the 3386880 and divide by 1.5, you're going to get 2257920.
Can you imagine hauling blocks of that size? Uh, a block that's 1.5 uh, cubic yards, if you put two of them side by side, they would have more volume or about as much volume as you would have, like say in a car that, that big. And they would have to haul 2.2 million of those from wherever they dug them up to the site where they wanted the pyramid. And that would take years to do with an, an army of builders, or probably they use some kind of a, you know, unpaid worker, slave. They had slaves back then. All right, every every one of these problems is is different, and um, they but they all use some kind of three dimensional geometric shape. And uh, in this last section here, we're looking at volume, and we're looking at surface area.